it's a truly great honour to be asked to give this lecture. An honour because it is the first one in Cambridge, which is quite something. Um, but an honour because of Gates, and that I mean in two senses. One, of course, is the Gates Trust in Cambridge and all you scholars. And the really important thing, and the reason I feel so at home in doing this, is that, of course, you are already global citizens. You were selected as scholars because you are already global citizens who were selected because you made it clear that you wanted to make a difference in the world. So what better audience could I be in front of than the, 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 the Gates scholars in Cambridge? But the second part of the, uh, the honour, actually, is, of course, because of the Gates Foundation. Um, in my time in Oxfam, of course, we were very closely connected with Gates in lots of different ways, sometimes on the ground, um, but particularly, actually, in some of the global advocacy, for example, for getting more aid and so on, working with the Gates Foundation then. So I feel a great affinity in all ways with great Gates and how lovely to have this happening here in Cambridge. So a real privilege. Now, I'm going to talk in three parts, because the best talks are always in three parts, aren't they? <laughs> um, in the first part, though, what I want to do is to really try to challenge you about your thinking. Um, we don't really know the solutions, but I want you to really start thinking about this rather more deeply and perhaps in different ways. In the second part, which is more about the food security part, and, and just to be clear what I mean by food security, it means actually not just having food today, it means that people who have knowledge of the security of food for, for themselves it, you know, over a long period of time, but also, of course, food security, that there is enough food for us in all of us in the world. Now, in that part, I think we can be, um, demand something a bit more practical of you. There are ways, I'm sure there are a lot of you actually here who are, who are actually working on some of the issues that relate to food security. And even if you're not, actually we're all consumers of food and there's lots of things we can do. And then in the final part, which is about climate change, what I hope you'll go away from here from is real fire in your belly. Um, global um, scholars, uh, sorry, the Gates scholars are global leaders who are going to lead the way in the future. You, like all, all of us who have tried to go before, have got a very big task on our hands about dealing with climate change. And I hope I'll go, go out from here with you feeling that you really do want to do something about this, not least in 2015 when the global negotiations will be on again in Paris to try to get a global deal for climate change. So different parts, slightly different sort of perspective on them. But I want to start by um, looking at um, what um, in Oxfam we call living within the donut. You'll understand that in a minute, but you'll never think of donuts the same way as again, as you will from here. But I have to give credit to this for one of the, well, the deputy head of research, as she was then in, in Oxfam, a woman called Kate Rayworth, who really sort of put this concept together. But really what I'm looking for to start with is the big picture about the resources that there are in the world that we require to live on this planet and how near to the boundaries we are uh, in dealing with those, with those natural resources. So, first of all, looking at these environmental ceilings. Um, this, this work here, and I don't expect you to take it all in, and I'm really only really looking at the top ones where it looks as if we are already breaching the planetary boundaries. But this work was done by the Stockholm Resilience Centre in 2009. And the idea is to look at really where the proposed boundaries are about what is safe for the world. And you'll see with those top three, we're already breaching those views about what is safe. Now, you can argue about what the exact boundary is, and you may want to do that, but you can't argue that actually there are actually ceilings beyond which we cannot sustain this planet. That, you know, that's the key point in this. Now, if we look at that in another way, um, those are the planetary boundaries that we're already breaching. The, the, ones, the top three are the ones where the red is sticking beyond the environmental ceiling. But you'll see inside that that actually we are also working our way towards those environmental ceilings on other things as well. So that's where we are in, in, in environmental terms. But of course, um, it's, we also need to think about, well, who is it that is using up these resources? Because it's not evenly distributed across the world. And in co of course, it's us in the developed world that actually is, is uh, using that up. And of course, for many of the poorest people, um, they have another concern, or we should all have another concern about them, which is also there is a basic foundation, really, that we want all people to have. Um, and some of those are very obvious, food for example, or water where you can actually, you know the numbers globally who are not getting their basic needs met 
but you add into that some other things that we would require as absolutely basic to, to human um, existence, things like education, healthcare and so on. And even the blank, um, the white bit is where there is no real measures of resilience or people's ability to have voice. But they're things that we all say uh, in the, uh, well, in, the in, in human rights terms particularly, that these are the foundations that everybody should have. And we are clearly not meeting those. So um, we, we've got a, a bit of a, a problem here, and that's just looking at those numbers again. The top one, which I will come back to, is the food security one, where 13% of the, the world's population is currently undernourished. Oh, and it's probably, it was not too different from that. That was a 68 figure, 2006, eight figure, but it's not too different from that. So the question is, how are we going to, and this is to get to the point where actually we have a safe and just solution to this, where people get their basic needs, but equally we don't breach planetary boundaries. And here comes the donut. This is the donut. The issue is we all have to live within the donut. We have to make sure that we don't, as a whole global population, breach these boundaries. And at the same time, we have to make sure people are able to reach those absolute minimum, that social foundation that we have. It gets, um, some of these things um, get very difficult as we, as we start looking at the details of them, and I'll come back to climate change, but if you think, uh, uh, there was a challenge put to us not that long ago by Nick Stern, who's done an enormous amount of work on uh, climate change, and he said, in the future, if we're going to manage to, to, to actually um, deal with climate change, virtually all carbon emissions are going to have to come from agriculture. The rest will all have to be carbon neutral. Now, that relates exactly to this donut, because basically what we're saying is all of us have got to make sure that we live within that. And that means that for the developed world, if we want to continue to have global growth, we have to do that in such a way that we don't breach those planetary boundaries, that we come <coughs> back from them. And yet, what we also have to do is to make sure the poorest countries in the world can actually get the, the needs that they have and they have to have growth, <coughs> ideally growth, of course, in the way that, does, um, that actually, again, does not actually use up more of the, 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 the carbon emissions, but actually stays within that. But the real fundamental question is, how can we do that? How can we make sure we actually carve back in and don't actually go breaching these, these environmental ceilings, but allow people to grow at the same time, but not in the way that actually also reaches those, those, uh, breaches those boundaries? That's the set of questions that I want to keep in your mind, because I don't think anybody knows how that is to be done. But don't doubt that those questions have to be answered in one way or another. Um, that's, the, that's the very clear part of that. It does raise some questions about how we measure, for example, growth, because at, mo at the moment, growth is measured by gross domestic product, GDP. But yet, actually, it, what, what's happening is people are beginning to challenge that, because does that really describe what we want to do in the way we want to live. It doesn't, for example, encompass all the measures that we might think were important. For example, um, uh, the unpaid caring work of the world is completely omitted from the GDP, whether that's looking after children or looking after elderly people. So things are already omitted from GDP. At the same time, there's also the question, well, does GDP increase actually give us happiness? And there's quite a lot of work now going on. For example, some work that's um, called the spirit level, really, which shows very clearly that actually if you do all the, the happiness statistics, above $25,000 per person, you don't get any happier. Now, you can understand why that might be, because if you don't have that very basic, you, there's a lot of things you don't get. But it's not obvious that you get any happier above that. So we're measuring all these things about increased wealth and so on, but it's not entirely clear that it does make us happier. And of course, recently, the, the issues about inequalities as a whole in society are beginning to come to the fore, because also the evidence suggests that at gross inequalities, actually everybody gets a bit more unhappy, even the wealthy people, because you've got a whole load of things happening um, which are not actually socially very nice things to happen. You start having actually many more people in prisons, you start having many more teenage pregnancies, you have more of the extremes of drug use and so on. All of those things come out in societies with gross inequalities. So again, there are some very big questions to be asked about what it is we're measuring and what it is that we're trying to do. Um, and if we're doing that, how can we do that and live so that it is safe and just for all humanity? So that's my, that's my first bit of the generality. But I want to bring it a bit more back to Earth, if you like, again, with, um, by looking at the food question. 
Um, now, in 2011, 840 million people in the world were actually undernourished, just in basic calories, never mind some of the, uh, you know, the good nutrition side. Uh, 300 million of those people were in South Asia, but the higher percentage rate was actually in sub-Saharan Africa. But of course, the interesting thing about all of that is, at this moment, we have enough food in the world to feed everybody. It is just not distributed well. But even if it was, um, uh, we carried on as we are now, it would still only require 1% increase in food production for everybody to have at least that basic calorific value. Now, that's, that's really very interesting, because we think these problems are absolutely huge, but there are, there are things that we can do. It would not be hard to increase global food production by 1%. That's now. Of course, the question is, how are we going to do that in future? And the Food and Agriculture Organization um, <coughs> has predicted that by 2050, we're going to need 70% 70, 70 more food produced to actually feed the population. Now, again, um, the reason for that is, of course, um, that the population itself is increasing. You know, it, it was the 9 um, billion figure. It's, you know, there's talk about 10 billion now. On top of that, you've actually got people getting wealthier. That's actually, you've got more middle classes. That feels like a good thing. But they eat a lot more meat. And in, in, in order to get a lot more meat, you need a lot more feed, feedstock to actually do that. On top of that, you've got the demand for biofuels, uh, which was a big thing that set off the food price crisis in 2008, actually. Um, so you've got, you, we, do need, we do need more. And this is the, you know, some of the reasons why that's happening. But so how do we get that? Um, well, there are some sort of, you know, pretty big ways that we can, we can actually start tackling it. The first one has just got to be food waste. Um, an enormous amount of food is wasted in the world. Um, in um, Europe and the US, we, we waste about 100 kilograms a person every year. And if you add all that up, the EU and the US, would actually produ that would produce enough food for the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. You know, that's, that's very interesting, you know, sort of what happens. Now, our food food waste is actually, in fact, between the supermarket and the stomach. That's where it disappears. Um, and that really is truly food waste. And that is a very interesting question about why we can't actually get that under control in the developed world. There's an enormous amount of food waste in the developing world too. And that is particularly because of the lack of storage facilities, the lack of refrigeration, the lack of ability to get to market easily and quickly, all those sorts of things. So first of all, this is not so impossible because actually we could do something about all this food waste in both, in both uh, you know, parts of the world. At this sort of point in the argument, I, also, I always get challenged somewhere or other about what about the population levels? Shouldn't we be doing something about trying to control the population? And the answer is, we know quite a lot about how we could do that, and we've known about it a rather long time. Because the two biggest determinants of fertility rates are actually girls' education and access to good contraceptives. We know about both of those, and both of those are actually not that difficult to achieve. And in fact, working, you know, really working now on girls' education is absolutely incredibly important for this. It's not going to solve your 2050 problem because just about because of the, the way the, demo, the demography is working, you've still got an inordinate number of young people who will reproduce. But actually, if you're thinking about um, sort of, sort of some sort of actual control or ability to deal with fertility rates, it isn't actually by being draconian in the way the Chinese were about the one child. It is actually about those things about girls' education. Um, we know, actually, that women across the world don't want so many children that they're having. All the surveys say that actually five children is about the maximum any woman in any country, not any woman, because there are some that want more, but on average, any woman in any country wants. Um, and in fact, the more education you put in, of course, the more people want to do things more for their children and the numbers you know, keep going down. So you know, that, that problem is not uh, you know, one that is, is, is equally impossible, though... I'm intrigued that those things were known in 1960, and it still seems to be that we're struggling to actually get even girls' education to happen. But if you want more direct um, sort of you know, issues about how we get more production, let me, let me just you know, turn to that for a moment. Because what we do need increased agricultural food production. And I think we know quite a lot about you know, how to do that. Now, in the development world, for those of you who have looked at development studies, there was a period between the 80s and actually 2008 when the food price crisis hit where aid for agriculture was completely a no-no. I mean, the numbers went dramatically down. From in, that, in the beginning of the 1980s, 20% of aid went to agriculture. 
Um, by 2006, it was 3.7%, so very little aid going into agriculture. That all changed in 2008, and everybody said, aha, actually we really need to help poor farmers really get on and, get, and help us for themselves, but also for the world, get in fees, increased food production. And people were making massive commitments, like you know there was meant to be $20 billion go in. It never all got there. But nevertheless, a lot of aid, a lot more aid, is now going into agriculture. What are the sorts of things that it's needed for? Well, it's needed for much better agricultural extension support. Actually, particularly for women, it's interesting that 70% of poor farmers in Africa are women, but only something like 5% of the extension services go to women. Um, so you need more of that. You need, you need actually some more fertilizer, preferably organic, but you need that too. You need rural roads. Um, you need irrigation systems rather than just rain-fed water and, 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 and a whole load of things, really. Um, but I, I will talk about one of the things that Oxfam has worked the most on, I think, because, I mean, the work on production has been over a number of years, but the thing that's probably been going on the most in the last 10 or so years is actually helping small farmers organise themselves. I often say that, uh, I used to say that Oxfam's key role in life was to help people organise themselves, whether that was in campaigning or in actual um, food production. Because the big issue here is, if you can get people into cooperatives or into producer organisations, they can do so much more. They can buy inputs more cheaply. They can also market to get decent prices. Um, and this is an example of this here. Um, this is a women's Ethiopian beekeeping cooperative of 9,000 women in Ethiopia. And they produce um, honey because they can have the hives near the house, which means they can look after children as well. And don't mistake the, the amount of honey they're producing. They're not producing little pots for garden parties. They produce vast vats like this that are now exported to the French bakery markets, to a bakery trade. So when you get people together, you can start doing things you know, in very different ways. They can sell also, not this, particularly the, this, this grouping, but in general, when you've got producer organisations working together, they can sell into the supply chains of the big companies. A company like Unilever that's absolutely committed to all this um, can't actually deal with 9,000 small farmers. They need that to be organised in a marketing company so they can actually buy through. And of course, if you want to say something about what we can all, all do, is to make sure that when, supply, when companies are buying through those supply chains, they are paying decent prices to farmers. That's a real you know, key part of all of that. So um, there's, there's that sort of very direct things that we can do on the ground, but I want to just talk about actually something about the power systems uh, in, the, in, the, in the food um, globally. There's a question about here, I've got here, who controls the global food system? And when you start doing the analysis, you start seeing just how much power is concentrated in a very small number of people's hands. And I just, I don't wish to read the whole lot, just take that top um, weighted um, uh, sort of yellow piece. You've got one and a half billion small well, billion farmers on one side, but a very small number of companies who are doing all the inputs into all the farming of the world. Very, very four firms basically who control all the inputs from seeds uh, and fertilizers. Similarly, you go across there to the traders and the processors, and you've got three companies who actually hold all the grain of the world. Now, that doesn't feel to me ever so healthy, and it particularly didn't feel very healthy in 2008, because when there was a serious food shortage, it appeared to be, uh, and people couldn't actually buy, and, and there were people rioting in various countries, nobody knew how much food there was in the world. Nobody knew how much grain there was or where it was. Now, I mean, that says in, in a campaigning sense, either we've got to actually sort of, you know, go a bit further and get, get a bit more competition in there, and or we need transparency about what's happening to, and not to have all this you know, the stuff hidden. You've then got the big food companies and the retailers. And in, in a way, that's the way where consumers can have the most impact. It doesn't actually take a lot. Um, if retailers, for example, are not um, you know, are, are buying down their supply chains and really putting pressure on prices, making people produce new products at greater quality without any further income, you can really put a lot of pressure on both the retailers and the food companies in campaigning terms to get them to behave differently. And unfortunately, some of those, because they have received a lot of consumer pressure, are starting to behave differently. You know, I mentioned Unilever, which is one of the better companies, but um, an interesting one is, you know, actually on the, on the, on the food uh, actually delivery side, if you like, was actually some of the campaigning against Starbucks. Um, Starbucks tried to use the names of the villages in Ethiopia where coffee started to use on their coffee in America without paying any royalty fee whatsoever. 
either to the villages and the farmers or to the Ethiopian government. I tell you, it didn't take a lot of campaigning effort to get an awful lot of people out on the streets not going into Starbucks, for Starbucks to decide that perhaps they could do things a slightly different way. And in the end, they did actually pay um, significant sums of money and continue to do so to Ethiopia for the use of those names, actually. So don't underestimate the power of small actions to actually bring about change. But you can see that there is, there is a, a real, actually, um, you know, a, a, a conglomeration, if you like, of power in a very small number of places in this food system. And I think as consumers, we need to make sure that we are, you know, sort of saying you know, what we want of this. I just want to finish off this bit because another thing that's happening, and it's partly happening for climate change, which I'm just going to come to, but um, one of the big issues, because many companies know what is going to happen in the future and are very worried about their supply chains, they are actually trying to buy up a huge amount of land, actually, particularly in Africa. Some of that is bought properly and fairly. A lot of it is not. It is bought, it is, it's, it, it's got by land grabs, frankly, where the land is just taken away from poor people who probably don't have formal <laughs> land registration ownership, or they, although they have historic rights to it. Um, and it's not just that the land is taken, that no compensation is given. And a number of, of organisations, including Oxfam now, are working very heavily on land grabs. And I was just tremendously pleased to hear the other day that actually in Cambodia, um, the Coca-Cola had, had, had done, done this. And basically, um, the campaign against Coca-Cola in doing that had meant that actually the people where, they were take, where the land was going were now getting proper compensation for their land going. But again, don't underestimate what's going on. Land is seen really as being absolutely a prime thing to hold. Some of it not even actually being uh, in, in production, but just because sovereign wealth funds, countries and, and companies are seeing that land is going to be a, a great shortage in the future and they want to get their, their hands on it. You might say, well, is this so bad? You know, sh shouldn't we get all these small farmers off the land? The answer to that, I think, is that probably in the long term, just as in Europe and America, there won't be lots and lots of small farms. But if you right now push um, uh, farmers off their land, basically you get a run on the cities, and the cities are just not in any state to actually receive them. You know, there is no infrastructure, water, sanitation, all those things. It's just not there in these, in these cities in the, in, in the developing world. So you're pushing people into abject poverty, really, by taking them off the land. Ultimately, it may happen, but it ought to be happening in a way that actually meets you know, th those people's needs. So that's the food system, and that's where we are now. We could probably actually deal with um, both... Uh, the, we certainly deal with actually bet better um, distribution in the sense of who's got the food now, but also even by 2050, getting that increased production. That's all, though, without climate change. And the question is, what is going to happen to food production in a climate change world? If the global uh, temperature goes up by two degrees, the estimate, and this is IPCC stuff, is that we will, the, the yields, without adapt any further adaptation, will probably decline for about 2% every decade. That's not too impossible to actually handle. You can probably, as I say, by, by adaptation, by doing things differently, you can probably, you can probably handle that. If you're getting up to three degrees, um, you're, you, you can probably still get some increased production in the higher latitudes, but they're definitely going down in the, in the low latitudes. Once you get over three degrees and into four degrees warming, um, actually, we are all in problems. You know, the view is that there is no way that we will be able to get the food production we want if there is that degree of global warming. And yet, that's the sort of degree, temperature degree, that we're, we're beginning to talk about now. Two degrees was always seen as a safety one. We're getting up. People are now talking about the, the three degrees and the four degrees. Now, um, let me just show what happens to food prices. Um, the, basically, if you, if you look up in the next 20 years, up to 2030, um, you've got your, your, your baseline, the thick, thick green one, is actually what you would expect to happen just because of those increased number of population, those other factors. If you then add on climate change, that's an estimate um, that was done actually was with the Institute of Development Studies in, in Sussex that did a lot of this work as well. Um, that shows you what's going to happen to food prices over that time as a result of climate change being added on to that. Now, in some ways, for us, that's not quite so serious because we can probably actually spend more money to get food. Of course, for poor people, that is really devastating. 
The reason is that poor people, even those who are producing food, actually spend about 70% of their income on buying food. So if you get massive increases in food prices, poor people simply can't buy it. Quite often, and that's what happened in 2008, it is not ultimately a food shortage sometimes, or it has been in the past. It's actually that poor people just have not got the money, because they're already spending so, money, so much of their money on food. They can't actually go along with an increase. And that's what happened. That's what happened in 2008 um, when, we, when we got that crisis. That's a, a relatively stable look at what might go on. Um, but I want to also look at what is a actually already happening in climate change and how that makes it even worse for poor people. And that's just a picture of what climate change does look like in the developing world. And um, that is just uh, in, in the Sahel showing what happens to the, the maze there. Now, the real issues for poor people alongside this, there, there are a number of things. There's a general trend, first of all, in those food prices. Um, but on top of that, for farmers in the poorest countries, what is happening already is climate change has happened. It's not that it's you know, just beginning to happen as we're seeing here. It has happened. People don't know when rains are coming because often rains come completely unpredictably, not when they used to. They may plant things, but they'll get washed away. The, the commonest phrase that I, ever, I heard in, in my Oxfam travels in the last five years was basically people saying, the seasons have changed and we don't know what's happening and we don't know why. And it's that uncertainty which makes farming in the developing countries really, really very difficult. It's particularly difficult, of course, um, when you've got the extreme weather events. And extreme weather events, that means floods, droughts and so on. They have doubled between 1990 and 2005. And of course, it is the developing world that is most affected by those. The places where those extreme weather events hit are those that are nearer the equator, fundamentally. Those are those extremes that, that, that are happening. Now, for us, an extreme weather event doesn't cause a disaster. An event happens, but we are not hugely vulnerable to that. For poor people, of course, where they live, they are extremely vulnerable to that. Um, the places that they live are very vulnerable, the housing that they live in, but also, of course, their farming is extremely vulnerable to those changes. So it's not the generality only of, of what's happening that is a problem. It is actually the fact that poor people have to deal with extremes, and yet they don't have the capability um, to do that. What happens um, when there are extreme weather events um, I mean, things, for example, countries often put boundaries on, on where they are allowed to export. In 2010, Nigeria, for example, stopped any export of maize into Niger, although they were very near to the, the sort of, you know, the sort of real food security famine sort of point. But it's not just the, when we have extreme weather in, in these countries that it matters. Actually, if you get extreme weather events, as we had in the US in 2012 when there was a major drought, or in Russia in 2012 um, when there was a heat wave, that also, of course, affects global food prices absolutely dramatically. Um, it's not just in these, you know, the countries where people are, you know, and, and, where, they're, and where they're living. So we, we have, as, as, you know, I think I'm making clear, you know, a, a, some really very serious issues <coughs> about food in its own right. We can do more food security. We've got to worry about how climate change is affecting food uh, production um, but it's not, at the moment, it's not going to go away because actually the poorest people are already being hit. And even if we did everything right tomorrow about carbon emissions, it would probably be 30 to 50 years before we got anything nor near to back to normality, you know, for the poorest people in the world. So what do we need to do um, to help poor people, even if the best things were going to happen now? Um, and the first uh, thing, of course, is actually to try to work to help people, you know, help themselves. And I put this picture on because, um, you know, it's too easy to think about um, aid in particular as being, you know, sort of, you know, expats from, you know, developed countries going out and actually doing something for poor people. It's poor people who are really working very hard to try and help themselves. This is actually a women's group which takes, is, is very common in Bangladesh. It's down in the area. I was, you can probably see me in the, sitting on the floor there. Um, it, this was my last visit for Oxfam. It was down to the area where sea level rise is happening because of climate change in the south of Bangladesh. These people are actually, you know, working on how to make sure that when uh, these extreme weather events happen, the cyclones, that they really help themselves. And actually a lot of it is women's organisation. 
It's the women who get together and organise the cyclone shelters, making sure that actually there are dry goods there, that there are cooking pots there. It's the women who actually send the messages village to village. It used to be radio, it's now mobile phones, thank goodness. That has enormously helped actually people's security uh, in, these, in these very insecure areas. Another thing that um, actually is happening now throughout the sort of aid world really is that um, when there are food crises, instead of giving out food, the real common practice now is to give out cash to people. Um, the reason for that is if you just actually take food in, you will often result in food in effect being dumped in countries, which means that the poor farmers who are producing actually can't produce and they won't invest for the next year because there's too much food actually around. It is far better actually to buy food um, uh, if, if, even if you feel that actually you've got to uh, physically hand out food to people, it's much better to buy it locally if you possibly can. But what actually a lot of people are doing is making sure now that the cash goes into people's hands, and I have to say it almost always goes into women's hands because they do actually spend it on food. Um, and this was, again, a visit I had um, just near the end um, of my time in Oxfam, and, and I went into a, a mud hut up there and I said, I've seen the future, and it's into Kana, and it really was, because in, in, the, in the, the Tuckle hut there, there was a man who came from Equity Bank, which, ran the, which actually won the Global Award for bank, a, a banking entre, an enterprise um, a couple of years ago. So there was a man from Equity Bank sitting there, and he's sitting there um, with his money, which he's brought up, and he only goes and visits every couple of months, and all of the community who were entitled to cash had got their smart cards and they were identified by their thumbprint. So I'm sitting in the tuckle and this elderly lady is pushed in in a wheelbarrow. She's probably not that old, actually. She's probably my age, but she, you know, she was really looking quite old and she couldn't clearly walk. She got her smart card out of her pocket. She put her thumbprint on the man's machine. It ticked away and said what money she was entitled to and he gave her her money and off she went. Um, I don't think we can do that in the UK really quite that easily yet. <laughs> so I really did think it was the future. So um, one is helping people help themselves. We clearly need to do a lot on the sustainable agriculture side. Um, that's a, um, in Malawi with drought resistant crops. But there are a lot of things we can do to actually help with the, with the climate change adaptation needs in agriculture as well, and that's terribly important. But as I come to an end of all this, I mean, the key question, of course, on, on uh, how we can deal with all of this is actually, fundamentally, we have to deal with our carbon emissions. There is no question about that. If we are going to solve this problem, even in the <coughs> long term, we have to do that. Which comes back to that point that I made at the right of the start. Next year is a very significant year for climate negotiations. A few years back, we had the big negotiations in Copenhagen, and I think a lot of people across the world felt sort of that actually governments must really see sense in all this. It would see that actually there were some very serious problems that needed to be dealt with you know, in the long term, and they would come to some agreement. Whereas actually what happened in Copenhagen was an absolute disaster. Nothing very much came out of it at all, and it was pushed back to 2015. We really cannot have that happen again. We have to find a way of everybody in all their countries getting their messages to their own governments that actually they expect leadership that will really deal with this problem because we, you know, it, 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 it has to be dealt with ultimately. ultimately. Lots of people are talking now about how to do that. Um, you know, for instance, there are discussions about, there are lots of cities now across the world who really, really want to deal with uh, uh, the environment and are, are really taking steps to do that in their own cities. And that's great because that's actually beginning to give some momentum that these things can be done. Um, there was a recent report by, you know, again mentioning Nick Stern, showing actually if you really invested in renewable energies, just how good that could be for people's economies in creating jobs and so on. There are many companies now um, who have come together to actually say that they want actually decisions on climate change to be taken because they want to know what the future regulations will be. They, will, they want to know what actually the carbon price will be in the future because it makes it so much more easy for them to prepare for the future, to know what to invest in, to know whether they've got to invest in more energy efficiency, um, you know, to know, you know how their product is going to be viewed in future, all those sorts of things that, they, that many of the industries want to know. But of course, there are vast subsidies of money going to the fossil fuels in the fuel industry. And particularly in the US, the amount of lobbying that is going on from the fossil fuel companies is absolutely uh, enormous, really. 
And it's very hard in those circumstances, say particularly for the US government, to take decisions when actually the pressure is on you know, just that hard. Fortunately, some things are on the move. Um, there was a meeting very recently in New York um, where a lot of companies came together to start making their, you know, their statement in advance of 2015 that they did want um, actually a carbon to, to, to get clear what the level of carbon tax was going to be. They felt they needed it for the future. And, and perhaps the good news is it there were a couple of um, oil companies in that, actually BP and Statoil from Norway actually signed up to that as well. So you've still got companies that are still absolutely pushing and pushing on fossil fuels, but actually there are other companies who are beginning to see the way. So um, all I would do is encourage you in the next year to really engage with this in whatever way you want. There are lots of organisations, all the development and, and environment organisations in the UK have come together <coughs> to act jointly on this because it's, there's power in actually the voice being the same from across those whole sectors. That will be true in other countries across the world as well. Um, there will be a lot of action last in, in the next year. Um, I don't know quite whether, whether this will be reproduced, but in, in the Copenhagen year, for example, Oxfam hold cl held climate hearings in many of the developing countries with local partners so that those people could also say to their governments what they really wanted. Many of us, many agencies, took climate witnesses to Copenhagen so that actually the decision makers could actually hear from poor people themselves what they were already experiencing. I'm sure all of those things are going to be going on again next year, but it requires the support and thinking of actually people like you, who are the leaders of tomorrow, to really get in there you know, and take your actions in whatever form you, you want. Personally, I think that ultimately we will crack, crack the climate change problem. For me, that eventually things are going to get so difficult for all of us that, that, that will, those decisions will be taken. But for me, coming from that background of working in Oxfam with poor people and with the concerns of poor people, for me, it's not whether it happens, it's when it happens. The longer this goes on, the more people, poor people are going to have to suffer before we find the way through that. So the issue for me is, can we please get on because some people are already in the midst of climate change. It's not something that's coming for the future. And I hope you'll take up that call. Thank you. Barbara, thank you for setting out the challenges that face us, significant challenges, so clearly. We have good time for discussion, and so the floor is open for your questions. And comments as well, they don't have to be questions. Yeah, they just still use. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed the way you set out all the challenges. Um, can I can just ask you, I mean, you made a comparison with Copenhagen, which is really important. Yeah. This took place when we had a recently elected US president, who's now entering mm -hmm. into a late luck year. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think that would do in terms of prospects for Paris? Mm -hmm. And assuming the politics is complicated, um, what's the role of campaigns like divestment, which would actually allow um, groups of, of investors to actually put pressure on the oil country? And sustainability of the fossil fuel based economy yeah. that you pointed to. Yeah. There's a sort of growing divestment movement, Rockefeller has just moved away from investing in oil companies. Can that moment put yeah. pressure yeah. when the politics isn't? Yeah. Shall I take two or three then? Thank you. Uh, that was brilliant, Barbara. I, I just wondered, it's not just the US government, though, it's Western governments generally. And I just wondered, you know, it seems to me that one of the frustrations perhaps that we all feel is that our governments are saying we can't do this because it will impact negatively on growth. Yeah. Um, and there's this real sense that all the action that would be taken would be negative and painful and that mm -hmm. therefore to be resisted. And I just wondered if you think the scope of turning the telescope round and saying actually how can our life be better, mm -hmm. not necessarily in a material sense, but more rewarding, more rich, mm -hmm. more um, happier as we yeah. talked about. But by going a low carbon, yeah. lower carbon track. I don't know if you think there's any space for that. And the third one? Yeah, actually, uh, thank you very much for your talk. And I was wondering how effective uh, do you think that if we trust people to adopt a more 
like I'd say, for example, vegetarian uh, eating style rather than meat eating style will contribute to the uh, uh, increase of uh, food source. Yeah. Okay. So let me take those three. Um, well, two of those three are, are very much about politics, and um, and these are big political issues, as you know. How, what, what will happen next year? Well, on the US, you're right. I mean, with a, with a year with a lame duck president, it is very hard indeed. Which is why I think, actually, back to the you, you know your point that there have to be other ways to get at this. There has to be other ways that pressure comes on, and pressure comes on more directly in some senses. So, I mean, I wouldn't want to go and say I fully endorse the divestment thing, but um, scheme, but you know, it sort of is a way to go, isn't it? Actually, you know, making sure that we actually, you know, look at really persuading investors to do things different ways, and that means pension funds, amongst other things. You know, that's a that's a way that people do have quite a say. Interesting on that. Uh, sorry, a slightly different diversion on that. But on the land grabs question, actually, the, it, the California and it's either the teachers. I think it's the teachers' pension scheme, which is actually now will not invest in any company that is buying up land in developing countries. You know, that's you know, actually, there are lots of ways that people can express their views, and certainly by the investment route, they can do that, and especially through. Um, and I have to say, we've got, we've got a little campaign coming on in Cambridge, I think, actually, about this matter, about where um, you know, pension funds, but also big endowments, like <coughs> universities' endowments, actually go, and which, um, which companies they go into. So uh, my view is you use every, every um, uh, bit that you can, and you, know, you, you try every different route to try and get this, because, as you say, the politics isn't working for us, really. So you've got to do all these other things, both if you like, some of the negatives, but also back to the Nick Stern and getting the cities together, the positives as well. Um, and the UK too, yes. Um, yeah, uh, uh, that's... David Cameron will sort it. Well, <laughs> uh, slightly not to be quoted, but David Cameron is a grave disappointment to me. Um, what I mean by that is, I mean, he did go to... <laughs> he did go to Alaska or somewhere and show how very concerned he was before the last election um, about climate change. And yet there has been so much that has been done in the last few years that actually has not held to that promise, which I felt was a promise to the public that those things would be tackled. So I, I, I don't feel you know, great about that. I think, I, I think you're right, Fiona. If we can try and talk about this publicly in a, in a more positive way about a more positive lifestyle, that's got to help. It's not all about hair shirts and how awful this has to be in future. And I think that was a bit of something that was a bit wrong with the environment movement. It's terribly difficult to talk about this whole subject, actually, because the environment movement know that they got it wrong, really, in the 90s, and they will say this themselves. They, they sort of you know, portrayed doom and gloom and put everybody off and made them feel nobody could do anything about anything. Mm -hmm. so, but trying to bring the reality out, but at the same time not putting people off and making them feel both they can do something, but actually it's not all negative, I think is, is really critically important. That's absolutely right. Um, I think that some of the difficulty is, though, is, 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 is it's distributional again. It's, it's who gets to do the things that you want to do. I think, I think, to be honest, travel, to me, I don't know, you probably know more about this than I do, but given coming from a sort of semi-environmental movement in the National Trust, as Fiona does. Well, I mean, what I mean is it had many other things to do as well. Yeah. But, but, but no, but an environmental movement, you know, that's... Um, it, you know, it, 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 people do like travelling, and travelling, unfortunately, is one of the key problems that we have to deal with somehow in, in carbon emissions, actually. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. On food, well, um, uh, Professor Pachori, who um, is head of the IPCC, did actually foolishly say on the, the British radio one morning that it would be better if we were all vegetarian, um, and really got poo-pooed on that. So I would hate to say that you should all go vegetarian, but... Um, the, the, if we could cut that down, if we could cut the meat down a bit quite substantially, I think that would, yeah, it would make a significant contribution to the world. Um, and that's quite a message in Cambridge, which seems to be a, a quite a meat-eating location, actually, in my <laughs> experience. But, uh, maybe I'm only eating college dinners. I must, we're working on it. <laughs> now, another, another group. Yeah, so I've got, uh, oh, we've got loads now. Um, well, let's go up the slope. Um, one two, three, to start with, and then just put the rest of you put your hands up the next time, I'll catch you. Yeah, please, yeah. Hi, uh, sorry to go back to politics, but just on the point of lobbyists, um, anecdotally, in the 1850s, the whale oil lobby was one of the strongest in the US Congress, and whale oil was the primary source of energy at the time, which, um, and a lot of environmentalists at the time were working hard to try and save whales. Yeah. But actually what saved whales was 
a quantum leap in technology in terms of extracting crude oil. Yeah. And crude oil became more feasible not mm -hmm. as, as a commodity. And how I see it, um, as just a personal take, is that um, ultimately what we're looking for is something along the lines of an economic solution. I don't think we've found a silver bullet in terms of um, alternative energy sources yet. But um, I was just wondering, would you be happy with all the options on the table, such as clean coal technology for nuclear, as mm -hmm. things that we can look at um, while we try to find this sort of other renewable energy? Well, uh, but well, just uh, first of all, on general point, the technology. I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't answer you. I sh I'm, I'm sorry, I'll take three. Let me do that. <laughs> too, too interesting. Go on. Um, just wondering what your thoughts are on the recent. Human Rights Council resolution to create a uh, legally binding treaty between business and human rights. Yeah, yeah, okay. And last one back. Uh, I think my question is very similar to the first. Um, thanks very much for your talk, by the way, and I entirely agree with you that it has to be confronted at some point. I was wondering whether you thought that kind of technological factors or political and factors and sort of advocacy, which of those two types of solutions will contribute yeah. to the Well, I mean, on the technology, I, I really do think, you, I mean, we have to do all things that we can. I don't think they're relying on technology and thinking it's going to come along in time to help us is the right thing, because I don't know that that will happen. But meanwhile, we should do all that we can that, you know, to, to get new technologies, you know, to work, to help us on our way in all sorts of ways, including those, you know, adaptations on, you know, on, on food security, not just on climate and things as well. Um, on the, on the, the, I'm very nervous about clean coal. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether coal is quite as clean ever as, you know, it is. I'm, I'm also quite um, nervous about, uh, you know, sort of actually you know, dealing, putting all our carbon, our CO2 under the ground and all these sorts of solutions. I'm not, I'm not sure about those. Nuclear, personally, I'd probably be slightly more sympathetic to, but then, you know, that has enormous political as well as practical implications as well. So they're not easy solutions. I mean, if I was um, one of the environmental agencies standing here, I'd th I know what they'd say. They'd say, you don't have to do that. If you really just go hell for leather on renewables, you could do that now, actually. So this is a matter of, um, you know, sort of political will again, not actually, uh, you know, a lack in ability to do it, really. Um, Human Rights Council. I haven't heard that one, actually. I mean, I was, I was quite involved in, in, in human rights and, and business, you know, when I was in Oxfam, but not, <coughs> I haven't heard about that recent calling for that. Um, I don't know. There are a lot of, lot of things about, you know, the, the ruggy um, issue, the, the ruggy sort of um, <coughs> principles, actually, on human rights and business. I think the key thing is actually to get people to really engage with that and deliver that. I don't know whether a Human Rights Council ruling on it is actually going to help you that much more. But um, I, would, I think I'm speaking, you know, you know, beyond what I actually really know. So I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly absolutely all there on business and human rights. But, but there are principles, and it'd be good just to actually really get people to, you know, really facing up. Can we take another three? What am I going to do, Barry, on this? Um, <laughs> right, um, lady there, another lady in front, and a, a man there, please. Yeah, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much for a very engaging talk by the questions that have been asked today. I think you've got a lot of thinking. Thank you very much for that. Very timely. Mine is more of a comment, rather than, and it's to do with something that you mentioned, or more so with what was left unsaid on population control, where the drive is to educate the women, the girls. I'm surprised at this day and age, we don't talk about educating the men. It's both. And obviously these discussions and these grassroots initiatives have been going on for very many decades and we're only seeing very slow uh, impact on it. So if you really want a good impact, you need to get both parties to the table to tell them what the benefits of whatever it is. And the same goes for other initiatives as well, they're working, working women's group. Or why not engage with the men as well? Why can't it be done parallelly? So that's my comment. I have no yeah. uh, background in uh, these kind of activities. Yeah. So yeah. it's a comment, and I was hoping you'd yeah. share yeah. some light on yeah. similar activities. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next one down, lady to down. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, my question follows up some of the divestment question, mm -hmm. and it's a question of the role that, well, it's a two-part question. The role of our universities in uh, driving the 
fossil fuel era further and also the sort of funds that we are invested in. Uh, because um, I'm very glad you mentioned that this, we can actually transition to a much more renewable society today. But our governments are actually, there was a report just released, investing 88 billion in, in fossil fuel companies, which is much more than the top 20 fossil fuel companies are only investing 37 billion, which is still a massive number. But um, And also our universities are driving this sort of, uh, you know, we're researching how to go into the Arctic, we're researching how to develop more from the tar sands, we're researching how to unlock the next, mm -hmm. what we call unconventional fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of happening in the same institutions that are researching how to solve the global climate change crisis, mm -hmm. how to solve the food problems that are going to come. Yeah. How do we confront <coughs> these things within our universities? And also how do we confront them in the sense that actually big things like our endowment funds, the Gates Foundation, that a lot of the charities of the world are also invested in oil companies and getting a lot of their revenue from that. How do we sort of tackle that divide? Mm. Okay, and the third one? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I'm in the development settings program here. When we talk about aid, we talk about aid as an intervention. So I'd be curious to hear about how you decide to intervene ways to help people organize themselves. Yeah, yeah. And then at the end of all of that, what's your exit strategy? Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so, um, yeah, sorry, I've, been, I've, 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 I've underestimated men's presence in this. I, I, I agree with you in the, the things I've said, but um, you're right, as much as possible, you say on, on the population control thing, you have to engage men in this as well. The key thing, though, is if the girls don't have, have any education, they have no ability to negotiate. That's what we're talking about fundamentally, which is why girls' education is so absolutely vital. And it's because girls don't have education. I mean, the numbers, as you probably know, are still less for girls in primary school and absolutely massively less in girls in secondary school. So, you know, that is such a big gap, really, which is why I emphasise that. Um, certainly in all the work that we've done, actually, you know, a lot of our work is jointly with men and women. Although in Oxfam, because of the fact that 70% um, ish, although the figure's disputed, but it's somewhere well over 50%, um, almost 70% of poor people are women. You cannot be a development agency and not have quite a strong focus on women in what you do. So we, it wasn't that we just work with women, but we had a statement which was every program would be looked at to see how it actually helped poor women's rights as part of it. Not that it was all about women, things were done jointly, but actually you looked, for instance, in producer organisations, not just those, that was a women's one, but there are plenty of other mixed ones, you made sure women were actually, in, say, the chairs of the producer organisations or the treasurer to it as well, always looking for a way that you could forward women's engagement, women's rights in what you did, but not, but I agree with you that an enormous amount of it is, is about working in, uh, and educating men. Um, back to the investment side, um, I think there is a move afoot from the Positive Investment Group in Cambridge to actually get this matter discussed at university level. Um, now, I think you put your finger on it. There, there, are, there are issues at the moment about, okay, where does income come from? Even the pension, uh, let me give my Oxfam example. We were in the Pensions Trust. And actually, of course, everybody in Oxfam was saying to, you know, you know, in our discussions with the Pensions Trust, and we were only one charity, basically, you know, we should put pressure on, we should put pressure on. But of course, the other side had to be, but these are people's pensions, and we do have to be careful about that as well. So, I, I mean, I think you're right, you can do quite a lot, but you have to be very careful, because usually the people who are holding money are holding it on somebody else's behalf for some purpose, really. And that includes the university, obviously, with its endowment. But I'm quite clear an awful lot more has to be done. Um, I'm currently actually, having, having lost, lost my Oxfam pot, I'm, I'm, I'm currently a trustee on a thing called Blueprint for Better Business, actually, which is looking at saying that mainstream business has to be operating for a societally good purpose. And that includes actually getting investment houses to actually do that and think about where they're investing. The good news is the early research from the investors seems to suggest that the good companies are, and this is companies rather than investors, are not producing any worse returns for their shareholders than are the ones that are not so good. Now, if we can show that as well, you can say you, you've got to do all these things morally, but we have to show in a business sense that some of this works you know, as well if, if people are going to really engage in it. Um, then quite a different one, aid as an, as an intervention and, and where we go. I mean, a lot of this, um, 
Well, of course, a lot of it is, 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 is develops historically, and, and a lot of it um, is about your organisation determining what it is really good at. You know, for example, Oxfam has been engaged in the whole um, agricultural development, uh, trade issues for a very long period of time. So, in some ways, there's one set of issues that are quite simple. You don't go rushing off into an area that you've never done anything about and suddenly think that you can take on big programmes. You may want to experiment, you know, as Oxfam is doing now. We're doing an awful lot more in urban areas because that's where the population is going to be. But you have to sort of build up your expertise in these things. Um, beyond that, some of this, I'm afraid, it is, it is a bit arbitrary. In fact, most of the countries that I think Oxfam is in, and it's probably the same for other agencies, is ones where you started, actually, because you had a humanitarian crisis. And then, actually, you moved on from that to say, well, what can we do about development? Because, ultimately, we want people to, to you know, poor people not to be getting into these crises, you know, particularly food crises. Um, and, and where you exit... Um, well, some, um, my exits in Oxfam have been mainly for, for, for two reasons. One is, actually, the country did actually get better, and there was no need for us to be there. And I can think of Kosovo being an example. Um, Albania was a country I went to and actually closed our programme, and the, all the Oxfam staff actually set themselves up independently as a social enterprise there, because that country was now wealthy enough, it did not need you know, the Oxfam you know, work, really. The other way is actually looking very hard about whether you are having impact. And sometimes, some of the countries, Burundi was an example <coughs> here, where our programme was so small that we didn't think it was making enough impact to make it worthwhile and sensible for us to be there. Or Peru, where actually there were loads and loads of NGOs and it was not obvious why you needed Oxfam. So there are some very, you know, there are lots of different reasons why you do these things. But I think the key thing is to be saying all the time, should you be there? Are you making any difference? What is the impact of what you're doing? And ultimately, to say that ultimately you do want to do yourself out of business. That's the purpose in the end. Now, how are you doing, Barry? Are you I'm going to draw the curtains. Are you? The good news is there are okay. refreshments outside, so you have plenty of opportunity to get Barbara in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> but before uh, people leave, can I ask you to thank Barbara for...